Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, fellow Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 60 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It is the place for knife newbies like myself and knife junkies like you to learn about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, and anyone who loves knives and is in the knife industry or business. We want to talk to them and bring those interviews to you. And it's our weekly interview show here, the Sunday weekend edition of the interview show. And Bob, uh, great to be back and great to be on the heels of your inaugural Thursday Night Knives live YouTube show. That was such a blast, Jim. I had such a good time doing that for a number of reasons. A, you and I have been talking about this for a while, and uh, you had your game so on point. You looked like a full-fledged TV technical director, producer, behind the scenes, making the whole thing look great. We had Alex Tussaud of Alex's Knife Box on, and uh, we had a, a, a structure of about five topics and one main topic of conversation. We had a little debate at the end. We wrapped it up in a nice little bow after... Almost an hour. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, it was great. I, I gotta say, and maybe I'm a little biased, but it was the <laughs> best looking news pundit kind of show I've ever seen. Well, that was our goal. We wanted to try to bring something, uh, new and different. Uh, not that we want to, uh, you know, copy everybody or that nothing wrong with copying everybody, but we just wanted to have a little something different. And, uh, mm-hmm. hopefully, uh, if you didn't catch it live, it's uh, up on YouTube. You can catch the replay, but we definitely want you to join us. Thursday nights at 10 p.m. for Thursday Night Knives, and that's live with uh, Bob and regular differing guest co-host, if you will. You said Alex from Alex's Knife Box uh, was our inaugural guest this past Thursday. Yep. More to come with us. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a cool thing about this is that it, it um, formally, technically, it's got a it's got a format, but we want to keep changing guest hosts. Sometimes we'll have a number of guest hosts. Sometimes there might be no guest hosts. Right. And uh, there's, there's, uh, we're, we're kind of setting an arbitrary time limit of one hour, soup to nuts, but it might go 20 minutes sometimes. It right. might go a half hour, but we're going to try and keep it an hour or under and just have uh, interesting topics of conversation. Well, hope you'll uh, make your plans to, to join the Knife Junkie on Thursday Night Knives. That's live on YouTube at 10 p.m. We'll uh, have a uh, reminder set up on YouTube so that you can... Uh, not forget it. And to be able to make sure you get those little reminders, you want to subscribe to the Knife Junkie YouTube channel and click the little bell notification so you'll be notified not only anytime Bob drops a new video, but also whenever he goes live. So you can go uh, subscribe to the Knife Junkie's YouTube channel by going to thenifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. That's thenifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. And Bob, a uh, repeat guest today on our interview show, someone we had back on uh, show number 25, Douglas Esposito from Attention to Detail Mercantile. That's right. Uh, Douglas Esposito made my very first custom knife. It's a uh, fixed blade gentleman's fighter. It's gorgeous. Uh, I always talk about it. It's got a beautifully hollow ground double-edged blade and and a tortoiseshell handle. Anyway, I follow him pretty avidly on Instagram. I love his work and had been observing his pivot into, oh, there's a pun right there, his <laughs> pivot into folder making. And uh, just having gotten my feet wet a little bit with regular fixed blade making, I know how infinitely challenging it can be. And to see someone taking that leap into folder making and doing a beautiful job. I mean, this man is a Marine. He can he can follow uh, orders that he lays out for himself, you know, so he's He's got a disciplined approach, and his knives show it. And he's, uh, I think he's about 30 folders in, 25 folders in. And each one, man, he's got he's got his own style. And I just wanted to talk to him about what it's been like making that transition in. Not only do we speak to Douglas Esposito, but we speak to his business partner and partner in life, Stacia Jennings. She's also a former Marine, and she does, uh, for attention to mercantile, she does their, what do they call it? Not software. The soft work. Soft goods, I guess. Soft goods. Yeah, I think that's what they call it. But she makes these really awesome hanks and um, knife rolls. So you can store your knives in a very classy, uh, cool-looking knife roll. Or you can uh, 
you can you can put one of their awesome hanks in your back left pocket and 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 incidentally every day of my life i carry a a, a handkerchief in my back right pocket uh, or a, a um a bandana and, and having spoken to them now i got to get one of these cuz they they have really right. cool patterns and and beautiful builds so anyway douglas and, and stacia talked to us uh, at once and it was a it was a great interview really my 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 greatest interest was finding out what the challenges are taking that jump into something mechanical because a fixed blade is not necessarily mechanical. It is a simple machine, you know? Well, that interview is coming up next, but first want to remind you that our podcast today is brought to you by a new sponsor, Bluehost. If you're looking to get a website, you'll want to get hosting for that website. And Bluehost is a good host. They have a, a neat little service called Blue Spark. It's a free service for all new Bluehost customers leveraging WordPress it's designed to jumpstart the build phase of your new WordPress website. Bluehost Spark is uh, powered by their team of WordPress experts, specifically trained to assist with everything from getting started with WordPress to installing plugins to account access and navigation, initial setup questions you might have. Bluehost with their Blue Spark service. So our podcast today, again, brought to you by Bluehost. If you're Looking to get a website, if you're in the market for website hosting, go to thenifejunkie.com slash blue, thenifejunkie.com slash blue. That's B-L-U-E, thenifejunkie.com slash blue. And thanks to Bluehost for sponsoring this podcast. You know you're a knife junkie if you answer to the nickname Blade. I'm here with Douglas Esposito and Stacia Jennings of Attention to Detail Mercantile. They are partners in business and in life. And uh, they've been putting out some amazing work. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks, Thank Bob. Appreciate Thank it. Here. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So just to remind everybody, uh, Douglas made my very first custom knife. And uh, it's a beautiful, I call it a gentleman's, I think you call it this too. It's a gentleman's fighter. It's a, it's a double-edged uh, drop point, almost dagger, beautiful looking thing with an amazing um, tortoiseshell handle. And uh, just yesterday, I was looking at your Instagram, and uh, you posted the perfect um, companion knife for this. <laughs> it's actually the a mini uh, Bowie. Uh, it's a mini Bowie with a a mirror polished uh, blade, which is absolutely beautiful. Which I think is the perfect contrast to <laughs> this finish to the black on and, black on black. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. and it also has that gorgeous um, tortoise shell. Anyway, uh, if that disappears from the website uh, you'll know where it went <laughs> not that so, we got a lot of not that we got a lot of tree huggers listening but just for the record it is a faux tortoise shell it's not real tortoise shell because i'm pretty tortoise. sure that's illegal in like 70 percent of the world yeah and actually i think it, it has a weird warping issue so i think people have veered away from that anyway so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so you know i call this italian tortoise shell I'm, I'm sure it isn't but it just sounds cool italian tortoise shell i like it so douglas uh one one can't help but notice when uh, you know I'm, I'm I see your Instagram you're, you're very uh, active on Instagram and I have noticed uh, that you have embarked on this path to folders. Uh, explain the origin of that uh, decision. Well, I, I, it was uh, from the beginning. It was something that was on the on the um, timeline. You know, last time we talked, uh, there's. You know, there's the artistic, there's the the mechanical, the material sciences, all these different aspects of this, and certainly on the the business arc and the as somebody that's carried a folder for I don't know ninety percent of their life, uh, that was certainly on the the horizon for what I wanted to do as far as creatively and and business wise as well. Because obviously, you know, I'm sure there's I don't know a hundred times more people that carry a folder then carry a fixed blade just from logistics and legally and all that kind of stuff. So definitely wanted to get into into that. What do you look for in a folder that you might uh, have yourself? You know, you said 90% of your life you've carried one. What do you look for? So ergonomics is number one, right? Uh, be able to cut whatever you want without cutting yourself. Right. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do the maximum amount of damage to your opponent and achieve the minimal amount of damage to yourself in everything right. that you do, you know? Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's where I started with everything. I, I really dig it when people 
hold both my fixed blades and now the folders and say, man, this fits really good in the hand. And I can say, yeah, turn it around, do a reverse grip. And they're like, oh, yeah, that, that's that's really – because that's really where I started was with the ergonomics of it. Well, they have uh, – your fixed blades and your uh, folders have different a different vibe to them, uh, kind of a different aesthetic. It seems like the um, the fixed blades have a – speak in one language. And the folders speak in it, I don't want to say an advanced language because that puts one above the other, but it speaks in a different language. Can you describe that? <laughs> well, so there's, so knives have been made since the beginning of time, right? So if I had to compare, man, I don't know, I may be reaching here, but I don't know, are you a fan of whiskey at all? Yes, I am. All right. Bourbon. How about Japanese whiskey? Haven't had any. Okay, well. So there's two major distilleries in Japan, and there, it seems to me, and I've talked to people, and I haven't talked to anybody at those distilleries, but um, this has come up time and time again. And there's, there's one distillery that is really focused on elevating what is already known and just taking that, you know, tried and true and trying to take that just 1% better. And then there's another distillery that's kind of focused on, um, we're going to throw stuff to the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> and I wouldn't say that my folders, I wouldn't say that my folder, I mean, if you notice with the, with the fixed blades, it's fighters, tontos, bowies. Like what are the most common and tried and true designs in a blade? And there, there's, there's a lot that has to do with understanding your history, knowing where you come from, appreciating the, the form and function that has served everybody for hundreds or thousands of years and spending time on that and developing that. And then, but whereas the folder, especially, you know, the, 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 the lock frame design is a fairly new thing, you know, with Michael Walker and, and people on and on through, I mean, you know, Bob Trizola, you know, and he, you know, there's, there's all that, but it's a relatively new thing. So I think there's, there's more room to, not be so derivative and to try to do something. And that's, I, I, that's what I struck out to do. There was things I wanted to bring over from the fixed blades. Um, and there was things that I did with the fixed blades specifically because I wanted it to transfer when I started doing folders. Um, you know, the, the part of the reason that I started crowning the handle and the blade and all that kind of stuff to begin with is because I like a flat profile. I like a, a close carry. I like to be able to either conceal carry or not having it poke out into this and that and everything. But I also knew that that was kind of the aesthetic that I wanted with a folder. So with the folders, I've carried that over. I designed the backspacer and the sides and the screw spacing and all those things so that I could carry that, that, that crown or that, um, that chamfering or whatever you, whatever you want to call it, um, on the handle and carry it over to the blade. So there, there are things that have carried over from the, uh, both functionally and aesthetically from the fixed blades to the folders. But I also felt like I had a lot more room to, um, kind of figure out my own thing and, and come up with something that was recognizable as, as something that I was doing as opposed to other people. You know, uh, you mentioned the the crowning, and I was um, I find uh, the the crowning of a, the spine of a blade to be very gratifying. Just it just feels good, right? Right. And it looks good. Uh, a lot of the Italian knife companies do that. Uh, the knife you made for me is is crowned, and and actually the tang sits proud of the handle material, and that's another thing that I just love aesthetically. But uh, I always found it funny to to crown the spine of a blade, which of course you know. Uh, oftentimes you'll put your thumb on, but then to leave the rest of the handle all squared off. Mm. And you've basically addressed that in how you're approaching your handles. Yeah, it's limited me a little bit as I can just throw stuff together and put backspacers on it. Um, but that's really kind of the, 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 the fit and the form and the feel that, that, that I like and I, I want to carry over. I think it, you know, the, even even the the pocket clip, the way that I designed it and brought it into it, it all fits together. It makes it so that it rides not stealthily, but it rides low in the pocket, but where you can still get to it 
Um, right. it, if you know what you're looking at, it's recognizable, but it's not like, ah, you know, skulls and wings and a dragon face and nothing. <laughs> like, I love skulls. Yeah. I got tattoos of skulls on my leg. You know, I'm not taking anything away from that. But I want it, you know, again, our one of the first sentences that we put together to describe what we're doing is hard use gentleman's blades you know like i i need it to still be able to function but i'm not in the military active duty anymore so i, I like a little style a little bit of form to go with my function at this point I, I like the i like the juxtaposition of gentleman's knife tactical you know I, obviously that's what really drew me to these uh but carrying that over into your folders i think is a is a, a smart move stacy from your perspective what has this process been like this transition from fixed blade only into both? Uh, well, for me, it's been seamless because it's all been a mess. <laughs> <laughs> when I go into the shop, I'm like, oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> but I will say for Doug, he has a process. He knows his process. And God forbid you mess with that process. Um, but, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's been seamless. For him, there's been a couple of sleepless nights, a couple of what if I did this? What if I did that? What if it, um, what if I changed this or moved this? So he, he's very much about the process. And when he's not actually doing the process, he's still thinking about the process. Yeah. Uh, before we started rolling, we were talking about how you're both former Marines and, and how, um, I, well, a lot of people I've spoken with who make knives are former Marines. And, uh, I was, I was positing that part of that is discipline. You need a lot of discipline to stick with something difficult, which knife making is one of those things. But also, uh, uh, the problem solving framework you sort of pick up in the armed forces. And, and I know for sure, definitely in the Marine Corps, uh, also could definitely add a lot to just that process of tackling something difficult. What's your role in the, in attention to detail mercantile? Uh, well, so I'm the soft side, um, even though I was a Marine <laughs> and hard as nails. <laughs> um, I, I, am I saw that side. post. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I do all the handkerchiefs, the knife rolls, the bags for the folders. Um, but, you know, I, I also hold down the house. Um, so when Doug comes home, he doesn't have to worry about the dishes or dinner or the dogs. Right um, he just comes home and, and can, can relax if he can, and get, if he can get the knives out of his head for five minutes. If people don't remember this, uh, Douglas also owns a very successful and quite awesome, because I visited it once, uh, <laughs> Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Muay Thai gym. You do Muay Thai there, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. And we got, we got CrossFit there as well. It's an uh, incredible space in Manassas, Virginia. Are you also a, a Jiu Jitsu practitioner? I am not. Um, I find it best for our relationship to leave, uh, <laughs> the gym life separate. <laughs> I'm, I'm the only sweaty guy she gets to roll around on the floor with. Uh, yes, well, <laughs> that's that's how you should keep it. <laughs> so, do you also carry knives, Stacy? Are, are you interested in the process of making them? Do you uh, are you a part of that? She's patient with the process of making <laughs> them. <laughs> so, well, do you carry one? Do you carry one of Douglas's knives? I do not, but that is because he is making me my own custom knife that has to do with one of my own passions in life, and that is Christian Louboutin shoes. <laughs> so oh. he is making me a black on red folder for me to take. I'm going. I'm deploying to Iraq to Baghdad in January. Oh, gosh. so he's t he's making me a knife to take with me. Yeah, she's still she's still active duty. She's an army officer, and so she's deploying in uh, in January. Yeah. Wow. Well, let me take this opportunity to thank both of you for voluntarily taking on the responsibility of defending our country. And my family uh, is greatly appreciated on my end. Well, thank you. To hear that you're going back, that <laughs> means even more. So, uh, what knife are you? You're bringing that knife with you? Yes. In, into okay. So it, right. it will be one of the the folders. It'll one of the be, one of the medium folders. It'll just be uh, okay. Black on it. The liner. It'll be black, and then the liner will be red. All right. We've we've talked about these folders. Now describe them. Tell me all about them. I saw a recent uh, Instagram posting where you said you were experimenting with uh, ceramic ball bearings on the pivot. Tell me uh, how these things are built, what what their makeup is, and uh, how you want them to perform. Well, I I'm a big two-hand safe open blade away. Uh, I'm, I'm 
coming from a, a shooting background and a tactical background, um, you don't you don't whip your pistol out to the side and then whip it out in front of you and you know it comes straight up the center and from the from the second it's out of the out of the holster you can shoot and it's center chest and straight and you press straight out you know um, and the knife is is um, an extension of that you know all everything that you do is an extension of the of the of the open hand and. Uh, or, or close fist, depending on what you're doing. Um, so I, I've got a real good friend, Steve Tarani, um, who's a edged weapons expert, karambit guy, gun sight instructor. He's very well known in the tactical realm. And I've helped him with a number of courses. And, you know, we put guys on the shot clock, on the shot timer. And, uh, you know, whether it's a flipper or they're flipping it out to the side or all that kind of stuff. And like, I get it. It's fun to play with if it's like a fidget thing. But if you're interested in true tactical deployment, drawing it straight up the center and opening it with two hands, having the blade between you and your, you know, whatever's bad going on on the other side is the most, uh, tactically and technically sound. So. All of my stuff you can open one-handed, but if you're doing it in a rush, no matter what kind of knife you have, if you're in a hurry, it needs to be center line with the blade open between you. Like everything is on, for you is on this side of the blade and everything for the bad guys on that side of the blade. And when we run classes and we do this stuff, we'll put people on the shot clock and nobody beats, you know, you, you don't beat it. And here's, here's what happens under stress and there's... There's multiple, like, there's videos of this and there's accounts of it. And when people try to flip something out of their pocket and they're under stress, it goes flying. So now mm -hmm. you've just, you've pulled out this blade and you go to swing it out or flip it out and it goes flying across the concrete and you're looking at whatever's going on and it, it, it's not good. So that if, if you just practice a little bit, you can be faster than anybody flipping something out to the side. If you just come straight up the center and open it with two hands and you've got it between you and the, and the enemy. So I know I just went off on a rant there for a minute, but. No, that's not a rant. Actually, it, it, it brings two things to mind. Uh, first, I'd love for you to, to tell me how your experience as a close combat instructor trainer plays into the design of these flippers. And I think, well, I think you just. Mine aren't flippers. Touched that. And, and that's where. That's, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's flippers. where we came from. So all of my initial designs are with mylar or I could do phosphor bronze um, washers. Um, I, I use the mylar because I can do whatever size I want. And then once I dial it down and, and I've had several 20, 25, 30 year plus knife making veterans go, yeah, the mylar is great. You can do this and you can do that and it doesn't wear out. And, you know, it works really well. My hinderers all have mylar. Yeah. I well, love there it. you go. Exactly. So, um, and it, and it gives you a very stable blade because you've got the most contact you can have. Now, a lot of people like bearings. I think they like them more for the flippers, but I was like, I'll try out the bearings. Um, uh, my buddy, my buddy Steve Kelly from Tie Connector makes them and you know, it's a technical challenge. So if you come to me and you say, Hey, I got a technical challenge, I'm going to be like, Oh, really? Well, <laughs> challenge accepted. Right. Um, so I, I wanted to try it out and see what it does. And so I've got, I don't know, I think, uh, I think I have nine mediums with the, the ball bear, the, the ceramic ball bearings. So I'm going to give them a try, see how they are, kind of test them out against the mylar, see if I like it. I have a feeling that I'll just continue on with the mylar. And then if I do do a flipper at some point, maybe go to the ball bearings, but I wanted to have the experience of, you know, there's the technical thing of like, okay, how much, you know, how much relief do you need? Like, where do you, do you take it out of the steel? Do you take it out of the titanium? Um, you've already got a counterbore for the pivot. You know, it's all, it's just, it's just technical engineering stuff, you know? Yeah. So there's no real, there's no real technical or, or there's a real, no real tactical reason for doing it. I just, there's people that are interested in, and they, they like bearings on their knives. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll give it a try. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to poo poo it before I give it a try. This makes me think, um, there's obviously, you have an obvious appreciation for, and you have a creative eye and an eye for beauty. And, and that's very apparent, uh, in the design of your knives. Um, an eye for beauty. But, <laughs> <laughs> well played, sir. Um, 
I was carrying a Sinkovich designed zero tolerance today. It's one of my favorite knives, the 0452CF. And uh, it is flipper only. And that's the one thing about that knife. I mean, it makes it look beautiful when it's closed and it's beautiful when it's open. But the flipper only concept and the fact that it's a small flipper on the end of a large blade, it always makes me feel like, yeah, in a pinch, this could be an issue. Uh, you know, if I want to just uh, open it up to impress my friends and to cut my sandwich at work, like, it's all good. But if I really did have to pull it out in a rush, I, I wonder how many times my my finger would slip off of that little flipper, which is little for aesthetics. So I ask you, does does what you were talking about uh, in your um, idea of opening with two hands, center line? Gross motor skills, um, man. Yeah. So does that preclude the use of a flipper? Are you are you just not going to No, I, I, I don't know. I know I'm not going to convince everybody. Like I said, so we, we, we talked about the fixed blades. There's a certain amount of you have to have an appreciation of what's gone before. And you have to, I feel like you need to do your due diligence and, and work through that. And I'm sure there's dudes out there that have gone straight to making flippers that haven't even messed, messed with fixed blades or any of that. So I'm not taking away anybody else's path. But for me, being, you know, having a, a sense of, um, history and understanding what comes before you, both in martial arts, and in the Marine Corps and in physics and metallurgy and all that. Like, if you don't understand what's come before you, then you're going to make, you're going to make a bunch of mistakes. And, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Have you heard that before? Oh, yeah. Yes. So, absolutely. like, I don't ever want to disregard that. And I want to, you know, the, the, the reason things keep speeding up and we keep getting better at stuff faster and faster is because we stand on those shoulders of giants. So I don't, I, I definitely want to pay homage, give credit, whatever it is, and also kind of have my own, my own process and, and, and have an appreciation of those steps. You know what I mean? Like, like to just, you know, to just jump to nano, uh, pivot, you know, nano molecular mm -hmm. pivots and, you know, like, uh, I'm not <laughs> that smart, you know, so, uh, let me. No one needs that. I don't even know what I it is, but I'm pretty up, sure no right? one needs that. I just that. made no. it up. <laughs> nano molecular. Yeah, pivots. right. You know, I, I just, I, I also like, it's not just about, like, I want to make a good knife. I want to make a good tool, but it's also about my journey, right? It's about, it's about my path. And like I said, coming from martial arts, right? Coming from the Marine Corps, like every private, knows who the father of Marine Corps aviation is. Every private knows who won two medals of honor. You know, like you ask any Marine anywhere and they can, they know this history. They know they have that, you know? Um, so that's kind of where I'm at on this. Same thing with physics. You can't just jump into statistical mechanics and all this other stuff. Like you have to understand arithmetic before you can go into algebra and algebra before you can go into, you know, differential equations, a diffy Q before you go into other stuff. So to me, it's just part of my process of, of moving through this. And, you know, if I decide that for whatever reason I want to do flippers, uh, I'll, I'll clue you in on a little hint. There's, there's room for that in my designs, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I can kind of see it actually. <laughs> but at the same time, if I want a nice, stable, big, fat, uh, mylar washer to give as much surface contact as possible. And I decide that that's the, that's the thing that I want. It's still totally valid. Uh, I, I think, uh, you staying with and, and really, uh, you know, perfecting a knife on washers that is not a flipper is a good move. Um, because I, I sense a backlash in, in the industry brewing because you know, people tend to think when the latest and greatest thing comes out, the smoothest pivot ever comes out, th there's this uh, initial thought like, oh, everything that came before this is garbage, <laughs> you know. Now <laughs> now I can drop shut my knife, you know, and I have to worry about a guillotining my right. thumb. Like, now I have that great problem. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, people tend to throw things away hastily and then, and then it starts creeping back. Well, yeah, but there is something so gratifying about opening a Savenza, slow rolling it out, knowing, knowing it's locked open and, 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 you know, also not drawing attention to yourself. And, and I think, uh, I think 
right now you're working on the Mark One, yep. right? That's that's yep. what the your medium and the large, yeah. The medium and the large. So I think I think having the Mark One be a washer, thumb open knife is uh, uh, refreshing. Sounds a little a little cheesy, but uh, it's I love it, and I think there's a trend happening more in that direction. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I'm not in touch with that at all. I'm not going to lie. I spend so much time in the shop. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear that from people like yourself that are more in touch with the trends and what's happening. And, um, one of the, one of the guys I've got working with me, 17 years old, he's, uh, my buddy, he's a Marine, uh, Marine Corps buddy of mine, his son. So he's been making knives since he was just a little kid. His name's Noah. And, uh, I get so much from him cause he's so, He's so in touch with, hey, this is the newest, latest, and this is the latest, greatest, and this is on, this is all over IG, and he's always coming in and showing me like, hey, coach, let me show you what I got, and da da da. Right? His his uh his father owns a jujitsu school, and we're in the same affiliation, so he he calls me coach because you know when he comes down to train with me and stuff. Um, but uh, it, it's it's really good to have people that are in touch with that because I, I I'm just not. Right. And, and I feel sometimes I feel bad because I'm not, but it's hard to stay in touch with that all and spend 16, 18 hours a day working on stuff. You know, it's just, it's, it's yeah. tough. So speaking of tough, what are, what are the challenges of making a folder over a fixed blade? And do you have, uh, I know you have a lot of friends in the industry, but have you had someone kind of uh, show you the ropes at all? So it used to be the barrier to entry was knowledge. Now, now that's not the case because with YouTube and everything else out there, you got, all sorts of people showing three different ways to do every step of doing anything. That being said, uh, being able to go and spend time in guys' shops, whether it's a day or two days or a week, and seeing how they approach things and and why they approach things the way they do is uh, hugely beneficial because I may not make the same decisions, right? But I understand why they made the decisions that they made. You know, and because I can say, hey, why'd you do that? And they'll be like, well, because of this, this and this. And I'm like, well, I've got different reasons. And the, what's even more gratifying is to have those same guys go, man, y- you could have done a little of this, a little of that. You could have you could have basically done a clone off of any of us. And nobody would have had a problem. But this mm-hmm. is different enough and recognizable enough and unique enough that. You're, you're doing your own thing, which is cool. And that, like that, that's like, it's a, it's a frame lock. There's only so many things you can do with a frame lock, right. but just, just the design, like to start with, how does it feel in the hand and go from there? And then, but even with that, like my, my blade, sh- my blade profiles and my blade grinds are, you know, still going back to, well, you've got a leaf shaped blade. You've got a spear point blade. You've got a Tonto. Um, I haven't done a drop point yet, but I've been kind of trying to figure out how to do that with the and still work with the same uh, ergonomics. And if it does, and if it doesn't, then maybe that's a folder to do down the road. But yeah, like there's uh, or the compound grind, or you know, like there's so many things yeah. you can do um, within the same framework. But it's you know at this point they're all they're all classics. They're all establish, you know, the bayonet grind. Um, not a lot, not a ton of people do bayonet grinds, grinds on folders, but enough people do. I didn't invent it, but people, when they see it, they're like, ah, that's kind of cool, you know? Yeah. Very appealing. Uh, only, the only bayonet grind that comes to mind is on an ultra tech and on a Mark, Mark one. Every time, every time I thought, wow, I figured this out. This is really cool. Within like a couple days, I see something on Instagram or one of my buddies and they're like, I'm like, oh, he figured this out. 17 years ago and then I, I'll, I'll call him or text him and be like hey man <laughs> good job like i'm i figured this out but only 17 years after you did Wait, let, let me ask you an opinion question there's an idea that i did not make up but now i can't remember where i heard it where um someone was philosophizing <laughs> about frame lock folders and that the recent um addition of or the the recent like ubiquity of of the of the steel lock bar insert Mm -hmm. uh, to interface with the blade tang is actually allowing the manufacturer or the maker to introduce a little bit of slop into the process or a little bit less precision. Um, Do you use a, uh, a um, stainless steel uh, lock bar insert? And what do you think about that idea of, of that allowing for a little bit more imprecision? Well, I I, I don't, um, 
So I've carried, I have knives that I've carried for 15, 20 years that have been like not daily carry for 15 or 20 years, but for years at a time, deployed, field, all that kind of stuff. And they still lock up fine. And they were, you know, titanium frame and a steel, hardened steel blade, um, and maybe carburized or not. Um, I think the argument can be made for, for carburization of the lock or the, the, the lock bar face. It certainly helps lock stick, right? It helps beat the lock stick. If it doesn't, if it does nothing else, it definitely helps with, with the, with the sticky locks. Um, and then gives you a, but I, I've never had one, uh, give out and I've, I've carried knives a lot. Um, I don't fidget with knives. It's not something that I just sit there, you know, if I have a new, if I have a new grind or if I'm working on a new profile, I might hold it and watch a TV show and kind of feel how it feels in my hands and see if there's any hot spots or whatever. But I, I don't, I don't sit and, and flip something a hundred times just sitting there and not doing anything. But I've, I've never had a knife that, that I've had to resharpen 10, 15 times because I've used it so much. I've never had the lock fail. And, and I don't, I don't have, um, any knives that I've used for any amount of time with a stainless steel insert. Uh, so, I, I can see where, yeah, you can, by having that adjustment, you can get away with a, with a little bit. But man, if, if you have everything dialed in and you know what you're doing, it, like I hand grind all my lock faces and that's actually probably less, uh, that's probably more because my fixturing skills suck and I, I don't feel confident grinding the lock face with a, with a mill, you know, but that's really the smarter way to do it. Building a fixture and building that angle in and doing it. And there's so many knife makers that are amazing that do that. And I'm just like right now, my, the, the, the biggest thing I'm working on is my fixturing skills because <laughs> my fixturing skills are, are, are beat, but, uh, it's something I'm trying to get better at. And then, you know, who knows if I get better, if it's more repeatable and it makes more sense, then I'll probably go to that. But, uh, I, I just, I, I haven't worn out any titanium frame, frame locks. Uh, and I, I haven't carried any with the stainless steel inserts enough to be like, have a real strong opinion on it. Gotcha. So you're talking about fixturing. Is that referring to setting up a method so that a method or a model so that each time the, everything is kind yeah, of the same? It's holding, it's holding the piece so that when you, when you use the mill or the grinder or whatever you're doing, whether it's a fixture or a jig, so that it's it's the same every time. Okay. All right. I wanted to ask Stacy, from your perspective, I've I've noticed um you know, I've seen that you've both you both go to knife shows together. And so what is your impression of the knife industry, the knife world, the people uh Douglas's peers in the knife world? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> It better be that they're all fantastic. <laughs> they are all fantastic. I love them all. In their own special ways, <laughs> their right? Own very special ways. Yeah, I, I don't know that I feel comfortable <laughs> answering the question. Well, I mean, just the knife community in general. I'm actually not asking about anyone in particular, but, um, you know, knife buyers, knife enthusiasts, knife makers. Do you sense a sense of community there? Or is that just something that gets blown up by people like me who, who just f feel that knife nerds unite <laughs> well so um i have a little bit of a skewed perspective because the first knife show i ever went to was blade show which is the largest um knife show in the world not just the united states the world and so um you know we were it was so big the year we went two years ago right mm -hmm. um they they it was the first time they opened a second room so we were in the second room and there were so many people there and and people literally spent the whole entire time. They started on day one, like, you know, they were the first in line and they started on day one and they went to every single table. Um, they spent the whole entire blade show and, and made sure they, they wound their way through every table. So, um, you know, they're, I, I feel like they're serious. They, they really like the craftsmanship. They like, um, they really like talking to us. You know, there were some people that spent, you know, hour an hour in our booth talking to us about materials and craftsmanship and and our background and and you know their background so yeah it was it was interesting um 
some of the other shows were were smaller, obviously, than than Blade Show, but but not any less important for the people who went to the show to talk to the the makers and and talk about craftsmanship and and what we're working on. Well, it's a, it's a real thrill to to actually get to speak to you know when you're an enthusiast with anything, I, I guess it's like that. But I mean, for me uh, with this podcast, it's a real thrill to meet people. Uh, whose work I admire and to find out, you know, the personalities behind them. So I think, I think it's, it, it's extremely, um, uh, cool of you to be open about that and, you know, allow people to come bend your ear because they're enthusiasts. It's like talking to their favorite baseball player or, or well, it's, what have it's, you. It's also very interesting. We've had some very interesting, um, stories that people have told us. Um, we had a guy who was, was riding his motorcycle through Pennsylvania or was driving through Pennsylvania. He met a guy who was riding his motorcycle through Pennsylvania who had bought one of our knives online and was like, Oh man, you got to check out this knife. So the guy who was driving hit us up on the website and said, Hey, I met a guy who has your knife and I got to, I have to know about your knife. And then That's, Doug was at the California. Well, hold on, hold on. Show. Yeah, it's, it's even more interesting because <laughs> the, the dude that had our knife, was from England, oh, yeah. <laughs> but he lived in California, and he was doing a U.S. tour of the U. He was, you know, through the through the states, but it was centered around knife shows. So he had it all set up so he could ride his bike around. And this was the the guy that hit us up was like, "Hey, I met this guy. The knife was awesome. I need to get one." Blah blah blah. That was probably what six months ago. Yeah, yeah. So I just got back from the California Custom Knife Show. And that cat was there. There's a picture the of me and bike. him. The, the, the guy on the bike was there. And he came up and he talked. I was like, oh, my gosh, you're the dude that met Brett at the, you know. And he was like, oh, my gosh. You know, and I was like, can we get a picture? He's like, oh, I feel like a rock star. I'm like, you kind of are, man. You know, you're out there representing the brand and it's awesome. So he's actually on the on the Instagram. You can see a picture of me and him. The, oh, the guy okay. with the beard right. and the hat and all that. Yeah. 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 So um, how was your experience at the California Custom Knife Show? Good. It was really good. Um, they all, the, the Recon One folks did a really good job at, uh, and I'm not, I'm not a paid endorsee, <laughs> but they did a really good job at getting a lot of new people there. I had a bunch of people come up and they're like, Hey, this is my first show or their friends were bringing them up. So they, they definitely got the word out and we got out in front of a lot of new people and, uh, and we had people that knew who we were that bought pieces and people that didn't know, like that's, uh, it's it's always humbling and cool to have somebody come up and 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 and, and pay you money for your hard art, you know, your hard work and creating creating something. Yeah. But when they've never even heard of you and they come in and they see it and they're like, "I need that. That is super cool. Please take my money." Like that, that's <laughs> that's and it's 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 not about the money. It's just validation at that point, right? So it's cool to get that that like I think it's cool. And it's awesome that somebody else, a complete stranger that knows nothing about us, comes up and, and digs it. At the at the other end of that, like when you came up to the shop and came up to get your knife, I, I love that too. I've done that. I, I basically kind of open that up to people when they contact me if they're in the area. I'm like, hey, if you want, come by the shop. And, you know, it's it's kind of a, a dirt pit right now and it's unorganized, <laughs> but I'll show you around and I'll – I'll show you the bargain bin and, you know, we can go from there. So Wait, wait, wait. It's, it's, you didn't uh, show me the bargain bin. I want, the, I want to see the bargain bin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, next time you come up, you get first crack at it. Well, that's, I mean, that uh, for, for my first custom knife, I've, uh, now I, I have two. My second one, I got a Greg Lightfoot recently. Oh, is, very cool. Which is really awesome. But uh, the, the experience of going to your shop and getting the knife from you, and then I asked you to put the secondary edge on it, and you said, yeah. are you absolutely sure? And I said, I am. Absolutely sure. Well, I don't know what Watch. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That didn't happen. <laughs> that was in a different state, I think. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that to me was really rounded out the experience and, and to meet you in person, having spoken to you, um, already. Stacy, your knife rolls. Tell me about them. I think I might need one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I started off with the handkerchiefs, um, you know, because Doug is a lovely boyfriend. He wanted me to be involved in the business. Um, no, and, and I, I can sew. <laughs> please, and I, I hate to interrupt, but I legitimately was like, "All right, look, soft goods is a good thing. I I dig the handkerchiefs; it's cool. Show me how to show. Show me how to show me how to sew, and I'm gonna make some of these just so I don't just just have knives at the table because right, you know right. it's like it's good to have multiple from a business perspective and blah blah blah. 
So she's like, you're not going to do that. You're so cute. You're <laughs> she's like, you're that. not going to do that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I totally will. She's like, why don't I just take care of this? Shut up and go make knives. So that's kind of where that, that, that came from. Right. So, so that's where it started. And then we were at a show and I was like, you know, I, th- I feel like we could make this dual purpose. It, it wouldn't take many more steps for us to put some pockets in this and then make it a, a knife roll for folders. And so that's what we did. And we, um, the, the ones that we have right now are based on the, the Japanese, like, uh, work towel, um, just because it's so, sort of that hard use, but, um, it's very beautiful. So it's still that hard use gentleman style type thing. Describe that. I'm sorry. What do you mean a work, Japanese work towel? I'm, I'm uh, so it's know. called a, te- a, a tengue. So, um, the, the Japanese use towels when yeah. they're working just to, to wipe their sweat, to wipe their nose, to like, it, you know, it's, it's like they're, well, it's a, a handkerchief. Bandana. It's, it's, a, it's a bandana. It's a bandana. It's a it's a cross between a bandana and a handkerchief okay. with a little more observancy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. So it goes, you know, with Doug's. We want it to be hard use, but we also want it to be aesthetically pleasing. So um, that's what we started with. Uh, we're going to be moving into um, some, uh, what's it called? I don't know. I think I don't think I've heard about this development. No, stripes. <laughs> Oh, plaids and the stuff? Plaids, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, you didn't run the plaid by me. <laughs> she did, she did, but but I thought it was a schoolgirl outfit, so. <laughs> you got distracted. Yeah, I got distracted. <laughs> so, uh, how many how many knives do these hold? Uh, right now, we do a seven pocket knife roll. Um, we can make them in any, any number. <laughs> she, she was like, well, what if somebody's got like, Nine knives. I'm like, well, then they need to buy two of them. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That's... And if you only got five, well, sounds like you need two more folders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Or no, three more folders and then another. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like yeah. the way you think. <laughs> so what's the reception been like on this um, growth uh, into folders? Uh, good, good. Um, like, like I said, so many more people carry uh, folders than they do fixed blades. Uh, so obviously there was a lot of pressure, not pressure, but you know, people going, Oh, I really like this, but I can't carry it at work or I can't carry it in my state or I can't carry it in my country. Um, so when you do folders, let me know. And, you know, and then, then of course it's, well, how, how long is the blade? And then I had other people, of course, that when I started doing folders, they were like, Oh, finally you're doing folders. I'm like, yeah, I've been making knives a, a year and four months. I yeah. finally started doing <laughs> folders. Awesome. Jeez, you know, man, like, what took you so long? <laughs> yeah, what took you so long? You slack ass. So, um, but you know, it's been good. I don't, I don't think you can, uh, I don't think you can. Well, I, there, there's, pl- there's, a, there's a, I don't know. I'm not going to say there's plenty, but there's, there's a few dudes that that's all they do and they crush it at fixed blades. And I think, mm-hmm. I think there's definitely room for that. And I think, um, there's an aesthetic, there's a, a work ethic and a, a, you know, um, a level of craftsmanship that goes into that. Um, but as somebody that's carried a folder and is, you know, at least as into folders as he is fixed blades, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of an inevitable thing. And like I said, when I started out, even the fixed blade designs, there were things that I was like, okay, we're going to do this because I want to take it over to the folders. And there was, there was actually things that, <laughs> You know, it's like you don't know what you don't know. So when I did start to do the transition, I was like, oh man, I don't, I don't technically know how to bring that over, you know. And then there were, there were things that I could, there was things that I couldn't. And, you know, maybe down the road, I'll, I'll figure it out and I'll get better. My, my, you know, my craftsmanship and my problem solving skills will continue to grow and I'll be able to bring that over. But hopefully I'll just be able to grow on the, the, the ergonomics and the, the values and the craftsmanship that, that we've been bringing and, you know, I just try to make every piece a little bit better than the last, you know? Yeah. It, it, it seems to me like both are very, very challenging, but it seems like folder making is just a, almost a different activity. It is. It is. It's a, it's a different, there's, there's a couple steps that are the same, but, uh, it's a completely different workflow. It's a completely different process. Um, there's things that you, you, you have to do, um, you know, flat and parallel is a, it's too, you know, it's 10 times as important, you know, not that you can get away with, with, with fixed blades not being flat and parallel, but the level of precision, the level of accuracy goes up. And, and now you've got, now you've got three, four, five, six pieces that have to be able to interact and be 
and 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 work together as a unit and keep that blade flat and parallel and um you know I, people throw it around but unless you do it there's no way you can understand what goes into it you know a lot of a lot of a lot of makers will post pictures of what they're doing and people are like oh that's cool and whatever but like they they really don't understand how much time guys spend on on you know getting the steel flat and parallel and making sure that everything's lined up perfectly and the holes are exactly in the right place and that, you know, things are, um, you know, honed and it's not just sanding and different grits. Like there, you, there's, there's levels of levels of accuracy and levels of precision that the, the folders are just a whole nother world. It's, it's like making a different, I mean, it's making a different, it's making a different tool a hundred percent. Well, you're, you're talking about everything flat and parallel and, and uh, the first thing that occurred to me is right on how exact the blade grind, the bevels, and the and the and the distal taper of the blade has to be pretty much perfect because it's sitting between two pieces of metal that are 100% parallel. And the human eye can pick up, you know, you can just see when when something is off centered, yep. or uh, you know, mounted off centered, or ground in in a wonky way so that uh, you can just tell. Well, and it's even, it's even tougher when you're rounding everything. Right, right. When, when things aren't all square corners, like there's room for interpretation and, and it, and it's, and, and I, like I've made squared off things and I've made round off things and it's definitely not any easier and it's actually more challenging when everything's rounded off and, and, and crowned, I feel. So, so how, how does this proceed into the future? What, where do you see, uh, A2D or attention to detail mercantile? Uh, in terms of your folders, like what what's coming up in the next five years, we'll say. Well, I've really put a lot of time and effort into the ergonomics and the design of it. Um, I know there's a lot of people that, and, and it's just again, it's it's just different business models. It's you know, you go back to the well, I'm going to take something and really tie it, try to refine it and make it the best that it can be, even though it's already 99% of the way there, or the I'm going to try a bunch of different stuff and see what's cool and see what, and, and they're both legit. They're both, they're both, uh, they're both good business, att- uh, approaches and creatively probably the latter is the funner because you just, you know, getting, getting wild and see what, uh, what sticks and doesn't. Um, I, that's just not, that's, that's not really, maybe I just don't have time for that. I, I, I don't know. I just, I really want to, make a good model and have a couple sizes available and I want to get better at like what you'll see coming up is like right now I'm doing a lot of 2D stuff. Um, I want to get into some 3D stuff and, you know, have some uh, contour, not just the spine, but the whatever and some textures, you know, I do the pineapples and things like that with the fixed blades. Um, I want to bring more of that stuff over to the the um the folders uh some inlays uh i've got an old panograph that i've been itching to try to get going uh but i've been so busy with shows i, I think my last show this year is going to be the new york custom knife show hmm. and then uh i was looking at vegas and it's a great show i just i think i'm going to my my shop needs a lot of work i just i expanded the shop and there's a, i haven't done anything like things need to be moved around and re re assembled and I needed to get to going with, you know, with the folders, it's a different workflow. So I've got to have my folder workflow and my, my, uh, fixed blade workflow kind of organized. Uh, but then there's, there's things like, you know, 3d stuff and inlays and, and, uh, stuff I want to do with the panograph and some other things that I, I've been itching to do, uh, that I just haven't had time to. So I'm, I'm hoping that between the November New York custom knife show and blade show, you know, in Atlanta, I'll have some time to do some of that and, and bring some different pieces. You know, I'll still be, I'll still be making stuff and have like a regular kind of making pieces. And probably, probably in December, I'll open up my books a little bit for some custom orders. Uh, just we've been so busy with, with the shows and, and, and just trying to, you know, make some cool pieces and make sure the stuff all works. Um, that I, I haven't had a chance to really do much in the custom. Uh, custom order area. So hopefully we'll, we'll open it up for a little bit in the beginning of the year, take a couple custom orders and then, you know, be, still have time to do blade, but still get some new innovations. You know, again, 
it's not going to be, you know, nanoparticle technology, you know, nanotubes and all that kind of stuff, but new for me type of stuff, you know, so that, right. that we keep, keep moving forward and, and making some interesting stuff. Ah, uh, well, I can't wait to see what's on the horizon. Thanks, brother. For attention to detail mercantile. I love your work. And Stacy, I've, I've been admiring your work too. I think, I think the two of you have an awesome thing going. And, uh, yeah, I just, I can't wait to see how it grows and to see what you're putting out a year from now. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Well, thanks for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for having us. Have a question or maybe you just have a comment? Give us a call at 724-466-4487. We'll answer your question on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. That number again, 724-466-4487. Back on the Knife Junkie Podcast, Jim and Bob here. And uh, as you said, Bob, another great interview Mm -hmm. with... uh, Douglas Esposito and Stacia Jennings from Attention to Detail Mercantile. And uh, your thoughts, key takeaway as we wrap up this edition. Well, one of the first things that really struck me, Jim, was how important it is to have a good partner in work and in life. Uh, You are my great partner in, well, this isn't work, but this is, uh, (laughs) you know, you and I work great together. And um, so for Douglas and Stacia, they they have a partnership in life and they have a partnership in work and they have a real resonance there. And, um, you know, they go to all the knife shows together. They have a, a business together and, and complimentary goods. And, uh, I mean, that was the first thing that struck me, how cool that is. Uh, to me, that's uh, the whole point of going into and making a small business. It's a lot about family to me. Mm-hmm. And there is a family dynamic between the two of them. And, and it's, uh, it's creating this amazing business. Now, in terms of the knives, I have uh, my key takeaway is I must have one. I don't know when I'm <laughs> going to get one of these folders. Uh, because, um, well, you know, he's still in the working out phase, working it out and, and kind of figuring the, the thing out, but he's got his design that, that Mark one is a gorgeous folder. And, uh, to me, it sits on the same shelf with a, with a strider and a hinderer, um, and a Sabenza in terms of design, in terms of, um, simplicity, beauty, and obvious sort of uh, rugged utility. I say obvious though. I haven't had or held or used them. I know him. Uh, I'm starting to know him and I know his work and I can tell that these folders are going to be killer. So I have to get myself one at some point. Seems to be a recurring pattern. You have a, <laughs> you have a guest on the show and you've got to get one of their knives. It's, well, that's a good justification, right. Jim. <laughs> but it, it also seems it, a, a fascinating thing to me was really finding out and having been in his shop, finding out the process and, and hearing about all of the, all of the minutia that, that has to be worked out to have a successful folder. And then to be able to reproduce that time and time again, uh, it was fascinating. And I think having that um, <laughs> attention to detail uh, that that he has, uh, you know, being a, a maker, a Marine, a black belt in jujitsu. I mean, that's a that's a nuanced art that has a lot of detail in it. So all of those come together. I think his uh, I think his folders are going to be outstanding. And you can find uh, that at attention to detail mercantile. It's spelled a little different. It's the uh, Kind of abbreviation for attention, A-T-T-N, and then the number two, detailmercantile.com. So A-T-T-N, the number two, detailmercantile.com. You can go uh, see everything Bob is talking about. And I also suggest, uh, if you're on Instagram, which you probably are, uh, subscribe to their page. It's Or follow them, whatever that term is. Uh, their stuff is great. It's great eye candy a couple times a day. We'll have links to all that in the show notes for episode number 60, which you can find at theknifejunkie.com slash 60, theknifejunkie.com slash 60. And if you missed any of our past episodes, you can catch them there. As we said, Douglas, a uh, repeat guest, he was back on episode number 25. So if you want to listen to that episode after you finish up this one, theknifejunkie.com slash 25. Bob, final word as we wrap up. Find someone that you can work well with and get to it. Just do it. Yep. Knife Drop, and we're out of here for episode number 60 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim Person saying thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. 
You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.